I hope. Uh, so the, the, the point of this is really a tutorial. Uh, and the idea is to work up near the end to explain an idea that uh, we, and I'll explain what we as a minute, we put out about a year ago and was just validated, uh, its first validation in vitro in the Journal of Neuroscience Methods that we feel is very, um, uh, I think revolutionary maybe, maybe it's an overstatement, but it really could, could uh, be very beneficial for clinical neural recording applications. So for those of you that know a little bit about this, I'm going to preload so you feel free to stand up and walk out. So I won't tell you how we can download your brain or any of this mumbo jumbo. And specifically, uh, it's going to be heavy on electrophysiology. So we're going to be talking about electrical recording for the brain at some, in some form. And so to do that, uh, I, we're going to spend some time sort of walking through the issues that arise and how that works and some of that. And then near the end, I think, uh, having given you context and even in terms of what other methods are used to kind of present this idea. But this is the work of a, of a number of us. Uh, DJ is the uh, brilliant PhD uh, who's uh, spearheading it, and along with myself, Elad Alon, Jose Carmena, and Jan Rabai, our faculty here. And I'm not going to go off and do the bumper sticker thing, but there's a lot of centers, and I hope to give you enough time glancing at them that if you're interested, you can go find out more about what we do. Some of these operations are very large. The bottom one there, Center for Neural Engineering and Prosthesis, is a joint thing with UCSF. And it's just a recipient of a very large amount of money from DARPA to try to push um, some of these things into the clinic over years, of course. But uh, we're very excited, and Berkeley is right now finding itself at the center of a lot of this stuff. Um, and by stuff, I mean new technologies for neuroscience and uh, pushing some of these to help people. Uh, what I do, let me do one slide on what I do, because I'm sort of a gadget builder, uh, and then we'll kind of push into the problem. So what I do is I build gadgets, and I, uh, my lab built, has built and builds all sorts of gadgets, most of which the vast majority we won't talk about today. They include systems for hurting cells and understanding how cells work in, in, as, as groups, um, the bugs. This is sort of, I always feel like Pee Wee Herman this way. Poor Pee Wee Herman was never able to not be Pee Wee Herman after he was Pee Wee Herman. Everyone knows that's about the bugs, no matter what I do. But we continue doing lots of interesting stuff. We build systems for understanding how bugs do their, their thing. We're very interested in the nervous systems of bugs. Uh, we love to compare what they do and freak people out by showing that you can fly them like little airplanes if you put the right things in their brains. Uh, we also do a lot of other stuff that has to do with medical applications for wounds and engineering that uh, talks to the clinic in other ways. So this is a system that's currently in review that would detect pressure also a big deal in hospitals before we can see them with the eye. So we're very excited about that. So we do all this is to give you an idea of where I'm coming from. I don't I'm not a neuroscientist, although these days I spent years with them. I build stuff, I build technology. Okay. Well so given that introduction, it's a it's a really good time to build tech for the brain, right? I think all of you have at some level seen over the last year and a half there's quite a lot of fanfare and money being uh, put into uh, the brain. And that's exciting. It's also dangerous, of course, because you can oversell things and give people the wrong impression. Uh, but the, the reason I show you this, other than it's you know nice filler for a slide, is that a great deal of this turns out to be a technology problem uh, because we really need better windows into the way that our nervous system works. Not just our central nervous system, which is the topic of the majority of today, uh, but our peripheral nervous system, which is a growing interest. And it's therapeutically very accessible. I think you will see over the next several years that not only our central nervous system technology is being um, brought on to help people, and I'll show you a few of these, uh, peripheral nervous system uh, uh, technologies are growing. Um, they're sometimes called electroceutical, it's sort of a catchy, semi-meaningless term that people that have businesses created, but you, you can see that this is beginning to be applied in many different areas. Big, big money. And of course at the heart of it is the quest to understand what you know, is going on. Um, Okay, so I want to point you, before I start talking, to two papers that I think are fun and thought-stimulating. Um, I think one of them, we're involved in both of them, but really it's not quite self-aggrandizement. You'll see how they both fit into the talk. And also point out that I'm happy to be interrupted while I'm talking. Some of these things might, might be funner if people ask for clarification while I'm going through. I'm, I'm very um, afraid of getting TV too quickly. The first is a fun paper that was spearheaded by George Church. Uh, he's in the news a lot, he's at Harvard. Uh, and we were involved in this along with a lot of other people, which had a, a fun quest, which is now a question, which is not really indicated by the title. And it's freely available. The reason I'm showing you is you can look these up and you can read them. His question was, and I think his is unfairly as a group of people, but 
his question was, if you wanted to, could you, if you were very forgiving with everything we know about human technology, if we were to extrapolate and be permissive about what would happen in five years with infrared light and what would happen with you know, wireless recording, whatever, could you actually, in fact, does physics let you record for every mouse in a, every neuron in a mouse's brain at the same time with enough speed that you could, in fact, construct really something interesting about what's going on? That's actually a question that, amusingly enough, had never formally been posed because it's kind of crazy. Like, most neuroscientists are correctly very concerned with you know, making sure the system that records from a few thousand sites, as you'll see soon, works. And it, it, can you imagine asking that question, right? They're, they're, there's a lot of neurons. Uh, but it's a very interesting uh, look for those of you that are technologically oriented because it walks through every modality, this group of people plus a few others that are sort of mentioned but not really made into the realm of the authors could think of. And we looked at scaling laws and asked these questions. And it's an interesting sort of short-term look at whether we could do this. And I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the answer either to a question at the end of the talk or uh, for you to read it. Because that's not the topic of today. The other one is the topic of today. And that's an idea that was put forth that I will get to in the last third of the talk after I've given you enough context, which we feel uh, might be a novel way of recording from the brain in a tetherless way. So this is a dream that has existed for a long time that we could put something near a neuron and close everything up and in fact be able to seamlessly pull out information. And I will put that in the context of other technologies that exist and I'll tell you what the limitations are because this generated a lot of crazy media that has nothing to do with what we want. So that's an invitation for those of you that want to dig deeper into deep deeper. Now, that is a cartoon of the brain from the web. And what I want to, uh, first of all, it's a ridiculously complex organ to which we're, we're not going to discuss it in any serious detail, but what I want to point out to you is that what I am going to talk about for the majority of this talk, with exceptions which I'll point out, is attempting to record from the cortex, which for our crude purposes is all of the wrinkly stuff up there. Not all the stuff is incredibly deep, which is very clinically relevant. And again, I'll point out the departure. And the reason we do this is that a lot of the planning that goes on and a lot of the decoding that goes on that is relatively high level in your brain happens in one area or the other of cortex. For example, you have a motor part of your cortex, which is responsible for figuring out what I'm doing right now at a high level is being driven by motor cortex and then sending signals down then through a lot of other structures, eventually the arm getting feedback as well. Okay. Uh, this is true for auditory, this is true for speech, this is true for a, a great deal of things that are of clinical value. Uh, you can imagine, of course, all of you uh, know that uh, there are a great deal of people that suffer, uh, just like Stephen Hawking, because they are lucid, but have a great difficulty getting that out. Uh, at, the, at the heart of a lot of this is trying to help that class of people, <coughs> not just that severe, but there's a spectrum, as you can imagine, of people which we could help if we could take out some of these signals in a way that is chronic, in a way that is clinically viable for decades and decades. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. So think, we've got to access the first few millimeters of that wrinkly stuff, which I'll come back to in a minute to give you a sense of the scale. Because if I don't do that, and I don't give you a little tutorial on what's going on there, it's very hard to appreciate what's hard and what's not and so on. And for those of you that have a, a great deal of background on this, I apologize, you'll have to bear with me for 20 minutes as I go through it. So, in there are, of course, we all know neurons, among many other cells, in particular glia, that kind of hold everything together and do perform interesting functions. There's neurons, and all of us in school learned that a neuron is this type of cell that fires a spike, right? That, that there's this sort of signal that a neuron sends down what we think of as this sort of cable, this axon, and that signal will then reach another neuron or collections of neurons. Some beautiful chemistry happens as Uli Isikoff here has, is, is, every time I see one of his talks I get depressed because the complexity of what happens just at the end is mind-boggling. But nevertheless, it's true that this happens, that the signal is sent down this axon. Okay, but let's think a little bit more about this before I kind of give you the technology. So what has been known for a very long time is that this signal is, of course, chemical in nature in some sense in that what the neuron is doing is, as it wants to transmit some information, this, this thing we call spike, from, say, one end down the axon to the other, what it does is it moves ions in and out of the through channels, in and out of the extracellular medium, the juice that it sits in. As it does this, just the fact that, it's, that, that it does this, this very amazing phenomenon happens that you get, you get this sort of runaway sort of spike, this, this 
thing that propagates, that's really kind of the transient rearranging of ions that, that moves down. And if you think about it from an electrical perspective, and this is where the little jump is required, um, you note that this has the effect of producing a difference in electrical voltage between the inside of the cell and the outside. That last bit is the part that matters, as we'll see in a minute. And this can be measured. I'll talk about how in a minute. If you're lucky enough that you can take this measurement in some way, you will see that on order of millivolts, so thousands of a volt, you can think of volts just like you know, reference to batteries or something you're familiar with, you will see as this thing propagates by, you're sitting at one point and you watch it drive by, it'll, it'll do this. And this is what people call a spike, you know, when you say, oh, look at the spikes of the neurons. They're, you're really talking about this. So I, I want to give you a sense of the scale. So you're talking about, you know, to be forgiving, maybe 100 millivolts difference as this thing goes from doing nothing to whoop, to fire. Okay. Now the question is, how the heck would you pull this information out if you feel that this is indicative of something interesting going on for, for one neuron? And so let me walk you through the electrical way to do it, and then I'll briefly mention another way to do it that's very important, and then move on kind of to what we want to talk about. So if you uh, have a very sensitive experimental setup, you can attempt to get a little piece of metal, an electrode, into the cell, and have another one nearby outside the cell. This is ridiculously hard. It's been done for decades and decades, and of course got people Nobel Prizes, but it's very, very difficult. Um, what it requires is that I have something out here that's in electrical contact with the juice, and mostly insulated, of course, right? So just the tip. And then I have a little glass capillary that I have a little wire inside, and I bring the capillary in contact with the membrane and pop a little hole and then thread the electrode in. So one of them is inside and isn't really shorting to the outside, and then the other one's outside. And then I have some way of, of measuring that difference. It, in, in cells, it can be done you know, on a dish. It can be done, and it's difficult, but it can be done. And there are technologies for doing lots of these at one time that have come online. Professor Luke Lee here has one of the earliest ones. Um, but you can imagine that in vivo, in a, in a real brain, it's ridiculously hard. Right? To the point of, you know, People do this, but you know the, the, the world champion. I think I think he's here. Can do like four, you know. Uh, and it's not, of course, clinically viable. It's not very <coughs> easy. To do. Historically, what instead has been done for decades is to give up on that idea. Oop, that comes out of place. Don't worry about that. I'll show up later. Is to do this. Is to say, okay, look, uh, we're not gonna get in the cell. That's crazy. Uh, we can't get the two millimeters into a brain. Like, fine. You know. What we'll do is we'll push two wires in very tiny wires, as you'll see in a minute. And they're both outside, but they're a little distance away from each other. And when all of these ions are moving around, I can't get that millivolt, 100 millivolt difference, but I can see just enough of a little difference, because there are ions sort of moving about outside as a sort of side effect of this. And that little difference will kind of track with that spike. And eh, we'll call that a spike, and we'll live with it. And this is called extracellular reporting. Yeah. I just have one question. Um, does this mean that all of the cells in the brain are very static, like they don't move at all? No, that's not true at all. Okay. But, it, but in fact, Jose Carmena has a very nice finding recently where he has some of these electrodes, and w w optically they watch how the uh, neurons learn how to deal with the electrodes. I'll show you a bit eventually. And essentially rewire themselves to deal with your machine. Um, okay. Which is one of the more astounding uh, things that came out of PMI a few years ago. That was Jose's work, showing that and I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's do it for fun. If I get a bunch of these electrodes in there and I'm using the electrodes information to do something, like drive a robot arm or some task, not only, not only do you have to, you know, does that machine learn, get a better algorithm for doing it, but it's creepy. If you watch there over days, the neurons are all rewiring themselves and how they fire because they're well aware that whatever is firing, the, 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 the net learns that it must be driving something and rewires itself to better drive that. <laughs> so this is, this is at the edge, this is the very edge of sort of this kind of stuff. So that's a good question. Yeah, keep asking those because this will be better for me if people ask the question. Um, that way you can also skip if I'm being too tedious. So, is it feasible? Yeah. To, to, to read magnetic fields generated by electricity? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, this has been thrown around for decades. Repeat and the question. The, 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 there definitely is feasible. Uh, you have to get some sort of current loop in there you know, close enough to do it. Uh, it's never, and this is an interesting example, debate we can have for a few weeks after we talk about this in depth. It's sort of debatable what advantage there might be in terms of sensitivity because the field, at, at a distance, the magnetic field scales worse than the electric field, right? And, you know, and so in the end, you kind of like, it's worse. And in fact, I'll touch on that in a little bit. I'll touch on that a little bit. That's a great question. Um, okay, so 
Now, there's a subtlety here, which is the fact that this is not how it's done. There's one little wrinkle which matters a lot, which is that you rarely get two of them in there when you're doing the clinical version of this. It does happen when you're doing science, but in the clinical version, often the second electrode is really, really far away. And the reason for this is that um, you want the biggest difference possible, and if this is connected somewhere, like some plate on the skull or within the juice, but really far from the firing electrode, it, it's the most change you'll get at all. That, that's, that's what you're looking for, yeah? Yeah. What you're doing here is, would that be the same if it's a human being or a mouse you're working on, or would it be totally different? Oh, that's another great question. Amu amusingly or amazingly, I think it's probably the word, uh, this, this is the same, you know, really across all of the neuro neurotypes, you know, that mammals, that we're even down to reptiles. It gets more interesting when you get to worms, like C. elegans, and their neurons were a little, but, but the paradigm is, pretty, is amazingly conserved. And in fact, a lot of the work that, you know, we do when proving these is on mice and rats. Um, and if there are differences, of course there are differences, major differences at the architectural level, but that this story works for both. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, now notice that, they have to be very far away to get a signal. I'll show you how big the signals are in a minute, they're tiny, that's, that's kind of the trick to all this. And then there's another problem, which is, it doesn't really look like that, it doesn't even look like this. It's far worse than this. There's bazillions of them everywhere, all around, and so if you're listening to the juice outside, you're not only going to hear, hopefully, whatever it is you care about, but all the cocktail party noise of all the other neurons, all of them talking and shooting ions around and doing whatever they're doing, and that shows up as a background signal, which, interestingly enough, was ignored for a long time, but recently, it's called the local field potential, recently has been found to apparently synchronize activity, which is a little weird if you think about it, listening to the signal outside the juice, and apparently the neurons might be listening too. Uh, and it's all low frequency stuff, but it, but it seems to coordinate what's going on. From our perspective, it's a pain in the butt. Because when I was one electrode in and one electrode out, I had this beautiful signal. There wasn't any cocktail party problem. Now that I'm outside, all of the chitter chatter is adding up, and it, it's not noise. If, you, if you're physics oriented, it's not thermal noise at all. It's some sort of correlated, some junk that's there that you have no idea, but it's going to be, a, it's going to be difficult for you to detangle the part that you, you think you care about. Okay, so that's the context. One last bit of context is, if you think about, you want to take one scale size out before I show you another picture, and think about, well, okay, that's fine, that's kind of a cartoon, sense, sort of silly cartoon, what, what would they look like? And this is, this is a, a, sh a shot of all of the branchings of these neurons in the you know, cortex, and the caveat is that these very specific barrels exist and are canonical in the mouse, the part of the mouse brain that deals with the whiskers, um, but it gives you a sense, I'll give you the caveats, but it gives you a sense of the general idea. So what's happening in your cortex is that the top few millimeters is where all the action is for our purposes. Two, three, that's amazing. It's two millimeters, and that's why it's so furrowed, because you need a lot of that top few millimeters. And so you imagine it all, so you get the most surface area you can. And that tracks, by the way, the complexity of the brain. You get more of these things, and you go down the other way, your smooth brain. And so this structure is about a millimeter... Uh, you know, spacing, and there's all sorts of information integration happening, and then arboring out again, and there's cells in here, pyramidal cells, that are really integrating all this information, but here, into this mess, is what we need to put something to listen. And think millimeters, just a couple of millimeters from the very top of that, which is the, where the membranes that cover the brain are, and then there's sort of juice, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid, and then your skull, and then this way you're talking about a few millimeters of coming. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that if this beautiful in most of the, your cortex, this is the mouse has a very stereotyped, anatomically very stereotyped uh, cortex, but the general idea that you have this type of organization is probably good enough for now. Yeah. What is the close to the surface pattern? Oh, so that's a, okay. Um, it's not so much being close to the surface, it's that, it, it, it's that there's a lot of other support hardware that's sitting under all of this that, that keeps the stuff humming. And so you have this sort of computational layer, and then all of these afferents that come out and go to other parts of the brain that are, I don't want to say more primitive, because it's a little silly, but you know, they perform other functions that are not the stuff that your cortex all this planning, sort of highly integrated stuff that's going on. But, but let me, is this an exa um, uh, opportunity to point something out that most people don't appreciate, but will become relevant in a minute. The more, um, you know, innervated uh, the, the structure is, the more vascularized it is. And it's something most people don't appreciate. So this is actually fake, in the sense that it's pulling out only the neurons. This is riddled with vasculature, with blood vessels. And one of the problems when messing with this is that anytime you see something this dense, you know, you can't go more than 150 microns from a neuron and you need to have a blood vessel. Otherwise, you can't get the, the nutrients and the oxygen and the waste out to your brain. 
And so your, your riddle with tiny vasculature, and then of course larger one, and it's everywhere. And this is a problem because you know, you, you're going to go in there and put something in there, you're going to bust a lot of this vasculature. Okay? The other thing, by the way, as a quick side effect, as a side, side note, since this is kind of a little tutorial, when you see all those functional MRI images that you see that look, you know, from the New York Times, and things glowing in rainbow colors, what's going on there is you're not measuring neurons at all. We have no way of doing that, that at, at that scale. What we do is we measure the amount of oxygenation that that vasculature is having to sort of deliver, uh, and that's representative of how hard that part of the brain is working. Because if the part of the brain is working, sort of firing at full blast really requires a lot of this stuff to, you know, the vasculature to deliver oxygen, and that's what we follow with functional MRI. Anyway, okay, so with that in mind, we're almost there. Um, now let's ask, what, what do people do to, do to take these signals out? Because it's a complex ecology of ideas people have tried over the decades, some of which with a lot of history. Um, and this is sort of a one way, this comes out of a paper by Schwartz I should have attributed to him in 2006. Um, and, and this really kind of shows you the scale. So let's start at the top, which is what we're most used to seeing kind of in the news or gadgetry wise. It's an electroencephalogram, the EEG. Some of us have had the same thing for a heart. And, and you all have seen pictures of people with electrodes on their heads, you know. And people have tried to make businesses about putting electrodes on their heads to run video games and all sorts of other nonsense. And, you know, I won't, I won't tell you what I think about those. Great. I hope somebody makes money. Uh, but anyway, what that is, is putting an electrode outside of the skull. And all you're picking up there, and it's very simple to think about this. Just think about a cocktail party or a large group of people. If I'm very far away from them, uh, what am I going to be able to make out? I'm probably going to be able to listen to whatever, anything that they're doing that's synchronized. Like if they're all singing a drinking song, I'm like, oh yeah, I kind of I know what that is. It's this because it's some synchronized thing they're all doing. So EEG picks out synchrony in large populations of neurons, very large, because you're you know you're pretty far away from the scene of the of the, of the action, right? Very far away from the cocktail party. And moreover, you're not in electrical contact with it. So you, not only are you listening to it, but you're listening to it far away, and you're listening to it in sort of whatever radiative effect is coming out of those diamonds. ECOG, which is incredibly interesting, and I, uh, we're heavily involved in this both commercially, at a startup, and, and academically. ECOG is an observation neurosurgeons made decades ago, which is, look, if I, instead of putting all these large centimeter-sized electrodes outside of the brain, if I make millimeter-sized electrodes, and I put them on a thin sheet, make an array of them, two-dimensional array, and I lay this over the uh, cortex, the brain, when I'm doing neurosurgery, that's in, in juicy contact with the brain. It's still f somewhat far away, you know, kind of millimeters, right? Uh, and I'm still only picking up large populations, millimeters worth of neurons, which is a heck of a lot of neurons. And I'm still only picking up something, something synchronized, but uh, what's amazing is that's good enough because of the resolute, because the, the brain is, the cortex is functionally organized on sort of a millimeter scale, it's good enough to pick up fairly relevant, prosthetically and neuroscientifically relevant information. And this is done during neurosurgery. They put this down, for example, when they're trying to remove epileptic foci. Very often they'll take data with this. But what's very interesting about this is that recently it was found, I would say recently five to ten years, it was found that in fact there's a lot of decoding you can do. So while these guys were doing surgery, they said, that they, of course, this is all proof. But they took additional data, like made them read words, or you know, a lot of interesting experiments that pulled out the fact that you can use an ECOG high-resolution ECOG to decode what the person's hearing. So Edward Chang at UCSF is a pioneer in this. Bob Knight here. Bob Knight is a powerhouse. He's been doing this for a long time. You can really decode, in some cases really amazingly decode, what the cortex is doing in different parts you know, the outer cortex, the speech cortex. And that has a lot of hopeful process. So ECOG is something that right now is very exciting, and particularly because you have to open up the skull for craniotomy, but you don't have to puncture the brain. The next two require puncturing the cort cortical tissue. So uh, this is really, both of these require you, and I'll show you pictures in 30 seconds, but puncture the cortex with uh, long conductive things, right? And they have, those are these wires we talked about. And, and th there's a lot of danger in this that I'll come back to and where neural dust kind of has a, a role to play. Right? Um, I jumped around the issue of light. Some of you may have heard of optogenetics and, and sort of voltage sensitive uh, light emitting dyes. And I can come back to it at the end of the question period, but the, the brief throwaway, which is unfair to them, but, uh, is that, not, well, that we do this too, but, um, is that it's really pretty far from clinical application. Although incredibly exciting and is changing neuroscience, I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. Happy to come back to it. Okay, now, we're getting close. Uh, what do you need in a good technology if you want to pull out this information from the brain? And this will apply to the periphery too, but I'll come back to it at the very end. 
Well, you want to, you want, you have some signal you think is important to you, whether that be spikes or whatever the ePlot pulls out, and you want to make sure whatever that technology is, of course, sees that. That's trivial. You would like to be able to uh, dis identify or distinguish or piece apart the contribution of as many different components as possible, neurons as possible, clean a signal. Now, this is where we get into the kind of difficult stuff. You want it to last a long time, so you don't want your electrodes coming apart in the brain. Right? So, yeah, sound, yeah, you know, but there's a lot of, yeah, it's pretty, that, that is impressive if you think about it long enough in terms of manufacturing plus it. Uh, and you don't, of course, want to do harm to the brain. You don't want your electrodes to harm the brain. And to some extent, this will happen, but we'll talk about how that's going to happen. Now, there's another one that's subtle. If I have something in the brain and I close it up, no matter how I close up that craniotomy, there is an interfacial route for infection to enter the, go through the skull. Your brain is amazingly packaged. It is very, very nicely shrink wrapped. There's a skull, you know, forget what, you have your skin, you have your skull, and then you have multiple membranes that really uh, keep it bathed in cerebral spinal fluid. If you didn't have cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid, your brain would weigh, you know, down on the bottom of your head and crush all the neurons down there and kill you very quickly. So it's a neutral buoyancy in a, in a bath. And there are membranes that, that sort of separate out these baths. It's amazing. It's an amazing piece of packaging. You have to go and you're going to pop all those things and leave something in there. You've got to, you know, that, that's an issue. You don't want to pop all this vasculature, right, on the way in. And again, continuing this tutorial mode, uh, now there's very uh, nice work being done on imaging to do a sort of tomography to look at all the vasculature before you really figure out where you're going you know, to put your things in there to avoid as much as possible the things on the way in. This is stuff that Tim Blanche at Allen Institute has looked at and a number of other people. Um, and ideally, you'd like whatever this is, certainly for neuroscience and certainly for the clinic, you certainly don't want to be driving around a Volkswagen worth of stuff. <laughs> you're not really going to behave in any reasonable way. And of course, for the patient, that's an obvious thing, but just think about neuroscience. If you're trying to understand the real, normal neuroscience of a rat, uh, how they do locationing, or you know, as they walk around their space, how are they processing this information? Uh, the rat's probably not going to behave very normally if it's carrying around a football helmet size worth of stuff. I'm exaggerating; it's never that big. But the point is that the smaller they are, the more they can allow it to be. So, uh, I'll show you a few pictures, but I want to. So, it's a little gross, but that's a, a human head with a non-micro-sized ECOG on it. So that gives you an impression of the sort of film. You see the membranes have all been peeled open. And the film is on there, uh, and you see these, these sort of uh, the cables coming out on the left, and the little electrodes are a little white This is micro ECOG. These are all out of our lab in collaboration with people. These are the micro ECOG ones that's sitting on a rat brain. Those are other micro ECOG pictures. Let's just give you a sense and a scale for some of these. I'll show you a couple more pictures before we get into neural dust. These are the penetrating ones. Okay. Uh, the one that did all of the brain gate, if those of you that have uh, seen the news in the last few years, and I'll show you pictures of, of, of those results, they were the first human uh, clinical trials were done with what's, what, what is this, this is Utah Ray, and you can see it's sort of a, a bed of needles that gets pushed in to take these reports. Um, here's one about to go into an animal, this is likely a rat. And then there's many, many versions throughout the world. Uh, this is not exhaustive, it's just a, I took it out of a 20, 2010 paper in Frontiers of Neuroengineering. You can see that these little metal, see here, the little exposed part? These are the metal electro sites where you're taking your recording. All of this is insulated, and this is on order, you know, this is probably 100 microns, plus or minus something. It's on order of a, the width of a human hair. Yeah. What kind of metals are used for the electrodes? That's a great question. So there's, a, there's decades of research on this, and, uh, you know, noble metals tend to work very well. On the electrical side, you then start to have problems with li lifetime, and so there's a lot of very um, difficult uh, surface chemistry and material science that goes into that's you know you put in a piece of platinum, for example, platinum electrode on a silicon nitride insulator as, a, as an example, uh, that works great, uh, but then you wait three years and it sits in what is effectively seawater, mm -hmm. right? And you're passing currents through it. It's a very hard problem to keep all water wins, right? Everybody knows that into it. Right? Water eventually wins. The water will find a way to heat at any interface. And so there's a lot of work. For example, there's work now in our group and other people with silicon carbide and very inert materials. People have done work with carbon fiber. Uh, there's some work with carbon nanotubes. There's a lot of uh, material science that's going on figuring out. But as an acute issue, like if I just want to get to work one day to do it, you put platinum here, it works fine. Iridium, platinum, these kind of things work fine. But this gives you a sense of the kind of things where we're the workhorse for this. Okay? And to really beat it dead a little more, 
This is one of those highest density things ever published. Um, Tim Blanche is at Allen, and so we work with him now to build these probes. But I'm going to show you uh, just how much data comes out. So this is 1.3 millimeters from end to end, and you're talking about tens of microns, so a tenth of a human hair's width, uh, separating these little sites. And each of these is a trace that comes out of one of these sites. And I want to show you this so you get a sense of the scale. So this is 5 milliseconds, it's about that wide of that plot, and 500 microvolts, half of a millivolt. That's how small the signal gets if you're no longer able to get one probe inside and one probe outside of itself. They're both outside. It's ridiculously small. Uh, and what you see is the spikes. You can see that these, these you know, three or four are probably pretty close to our neuron. There's probably a neuron floating right around, around these because they're all seeing the same neuron. You see how you can tell the patterns the same? And this is as a function of time. So as this animal's brain is firing, you know, that was a neuron that fired, and then you see another one there. And there's great efforts at Allen to use probes like this to get full fun functional mapping. So you, you, you can scan, take all this data, and based on how big the amplitudes are and where they're correlated, reconstruct where there might be neurons nearby firing and how they might be connected to each other causally. Okay? So that's kind of the science end of this. Yeah. How big is the background noise? Is that just the little stuff? Or oh, that's it. Yeah. OK, that was another really good question. This has been filtered. So um. this has been filtered not just for DC, you know, DC offsets, but it's also been filtered with some low-pass filters. So let me get into that. I was going to do it later. It was a great question. No, so if you want to reproduce exactly Every detail of one of these waveforms, in general, you, you have to have up to 25, your bandwidth has to go up to about 25 kilohertz, or 25,000 samples a second. Spikes themselves don't occur that fast, much slower than that, slower than a kilohertz or a thousand, you know, much slower than that. But the features of the spike that perhaps as a neuroscientist you might be interested in require you to oversample to get, you know, all of the, the shape. Um, clinically, to look for spikes, you need about one kilohertz, so you need to sample a thousand times a second to be able to, with some reasonable, you know, some reliability tells that there's a spike there. And I don't want to delve into this, but those of you that are electrical engineers and have a little background, of course, that the bandwidth of sampling is strongly correlated to how much you, you know, pick stuff out of the background noise, right? So if there's stuff there, you really have to think about how you're going to filter things and so on. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, because it gets to neural dust. It's great, thanks. So uh, I'm going to skip this. This is stuff we do in my lab. This is show and tell of the probes. And all the different ECOG, we, we build a lot of these gadgets, including a robotic stitching machine that's about to be published where you can stitch these things and you just kind of put them into cortex. Um, and, and that was done with Flip Savies and Tim Hansen at UCSF. There's a lot of collaborators. Um, I'll maybe come back at the end and give everybody their view. But, okay, so uh, last bit of background is that there are, in fact, and so this is a difficult thing with the cortex, right? But there are, in fact, successful uh, approaches to very similar things. Cochlear implants are a great success story. And they do something similar, but the electrodes are placed in the inner ear, and what they're really doing is they're, they're sort of stimulating and doing the same thing that the cells that would normally be there are doing for your ear, but it's also electrophysiological. <coughs> of course, deep brain stimulation has been the latest success story over the last you know, half decade or decade. Um, really, really helps people with Parkinson's disease, and there what's going on is similar, but the electrodes are slightly larger, and you go much, much deeper. You can see where they are, much deeper into the there's deep regions of the brain that set pattern generation for motor. And what's been found, really uh, almost trial and error, is that stimulating this with a certain pattern, like a pacemaker, really can bring Parkinson's under control for a, a population of people that is very severe, that, you know, where that's merited, right? I mean, that's, that's a full-time chronic uh, thing that goes into the brain. But you can see these are case studies. These exist. People are doing this. The challenge is trying to do this in the cortex. And uh, again, I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to show you the next slide. But people have a, a we, we, we've done this successfully to, with caveats. Um, there are a lot of people that have you know, very locked in syndrome, for reading, for example, Stephen Hawking. And the paradigm that emerged a few years ago, really led by a uh, guy named John Donahue uh, and many others, Schwartz as well. I, I don't want to sort of give up credit to different people, and we don't think let us a do. But, the, the idea is that you could do what I suggested, which is take data from cortex, take those signals, these are these little things I've shown you, have some algorithm that decodes them, maybe you figure that out ad hoc, it doesn't necessarily have to be whatever the brain is doing, it's you, you're doing sort of computer science, if you will, to it, just looking to see what you can do with it. And then you can use that to run prosthetic devices, and of course, the subject, uh, or the patient, is able to receive minimally at least feedback because they're watching what's going on, say in the case of a robot arm, and so you have a loop here uh, where you can take data, you can do something with it, and hopefully help people. And the, this in, um, 
in um, uh, non-human primates was where it was first demonstrated, but then it was uh, trialed out with patients in what's called the brain gate trials, uh, where it was shown that using that technology, which I've kind of shown you already, uh, you know, very, very professionally done, but you know, this, these are very, very serious sort of uh, technological, way outside of academia efforts, um, you know, you can implant this and you can see what it looks like. I want to show you this because this is exactly what this thing looks like. There's a permanent connection there. Of course, this can be unplugged, but there's a, there's a, you know, there's a thing to do this one. And it's taking data, and these uh, patients train themselves to use prosthetics. In the case of these trials, it's mainly robot arms. Uh, to feed themselves and to really try to recover <coughs> some of that lost functionality. You know, of course, you can, uh, you can always be critical saying in a crude way, but nevertheless, this is a really, really big deal, right? I mean, this is the first steps we're taking in this direction. Um, here you can see, again, just the sense of what this looks like. This is the state of the medical art today in trying to decode from the cortex in a clinically relevant way, okay? And so, with that in mind, we can kind of ask ourselves, What's, what are people going to next, and what's missing, and maybe where neurodust kicks in, and I think at that, that's 11.47, so I can do that in about 12 minutes, if I'm right. So, uh, one other fun fact, for those of you that want to impress people at cocktail parties, is that all of our existing robot arms are so amazing, I mean, well beyond, they're so amazing, they well outstrip our ability to control them. I mean, our current robot arm technology, you know, there's one that's called the Luke Arm after Luke Skywalker. I mean, I've seen, they're amazing. I mean, these things are everything you hoped for in 1975 when you dream of a robot arm. The problem is we, have, we, have, we don't have any really good way of seamlessly driving these things in a way that patients find comfortable and reasonable and effective over many countries. Okay, so this is the dream, right? It's a futuristic dream. Uh, I owe the, the next few slides of Jose Carvena, who I work with, uh, you know, extensively. You can imagine having some prosthetic. This is an arm, it could be any number of things. And this is the loop I was talking about. Okay? My part of this, and what I want to show you is, how do I do something that really lasts in the cortex for a long time? And what are the next steps for doing this? And what, you know, what's going on at Berkeley uh, sort of as a hub of one of these activities? Okay? So this is the loop. Let me show you where people are going and where neural dust sort of takes the next jump. And maybe we can come back to this and I'll tell you, some, there's a lot of fun facts I can tell you when you have this sort of cocktail party and press your friends kind of stuff. So, you saw that picture. So very crude and wired. So the first thing that's been happening for about five to ten years is people have aggressively, circuit designers really, have aggressively pushed how wireless we can take all this. You don't want that thing up there, and you certainly don't want that wire, and you would most certainly love to close the skull up and have nothing go through the skull, because then you avoid this route of infection. It's a big deal. So, a number of multi-channel recording things have been shown, which essentially keep the probes intact. That's this little cartoon. You see the four little cartoon shakes? That's the same as before. But now what you have is some sort of wireless technology. It could be a coil. In most instantiations, it's a coil. And there's another coil outside your skull. And that coil sends an electromagnetic signal that couples to the one in there. It's very, very similar in some sense to your subway card, your bark card. You, know, you put that down. There's no battery on your bark card. You put that on, and the reader couples just enough energy to get the number out of the card, and you're done, you go through. This is the same idea. You couple energy in. It provides enough energy to have that thing operate when it needs to take some data. There's no battery. There's no worry about anything like that. And the envelope is being pushed on, on these technologies. But they're all relatively large in the sense that they're you know, on an order of a millimeter or a fraction thereof. This is all stuff done at Berkeley by Jan Rabai and Alain Milan's amazing circuit. It's, this is the state of the art. I can tell you with no you know, straight face. Absolutely everything that's coming out in terms of how small they are and how low power they are is coming out of uh, Cal. Uh, the smallest one, the small front end refers is a technical term for what that circuit is that's doing the recording. The smallest front end circuit published is on order of a quarter of a millimeter by say a half a millimeter. And it consumes uh, a, a basically two millionths of a watt for every channel. It's incredibly low power. I think 60 watt light bulb, you can uh, sort of appreciate what that power level is. Very low power. Okay. That's where things are going uh, absolutely. There are companies that are you know, putting together things like this already. There's brain radio from Medtronic, a number of these. But that's not, the, that's not really the, the, the holy grail, because you still have all this stuff. You have this pinhead, this bit of needle stuck in the cortex, right? Um, so this gets us part of the way. We were wondering just how far you can push it. And for a long time, people dreamed that you would be able to miniaturize these little wireless chips, like your, your card reader, you can be able to miniaturize them in small. We'll make a coil that's like, you know, a uh, 20th of the size of human hair. Couple some power. Right? Well, why not? 
Uh, and, and what I want to show you is that that doesn't work. And that was part of the finding. Not only does it not work, we then have a, a way that does work, which is, I think, kind of amazing that sort of nature has that sweet spot. Oh, sure. So, as a, another sort of, for fun again, this is really just for your fun, this is one of these circuits, the full circuit that's used on one of these really big recording things. You know, even the smallest one, you can see it's a, it's a tenth of a millimeter on the side, that's that little piece of that little piece of the thing there. Uh, you know, it's, even the smallest one is hard to miniaturize, really, really tiny. But there's an additional problem, which unfortunately is physics. Physics, physics always ruins your dreams. <laughs> Physics, I have to tell you, physics, and then, you know, you all know, entropy always wins, right? There's a point in your life when you realize how true that is, but, oh, fuck. Uh, yeah. So, it's going to win! Alright, so physics always wins. So, what does physics screw you over here? Physics screws you over because if you want to have an electromagnetic coupling to something inside the brain that's super tiny, some magical fairy dust that leaves your brain, the problem is two things. First, speed is really fast. That, uh, light is really fast. The speed of light is really fast. That really sucks because the faster the speed of a of a propagating wave is, the smaller the thing. That, so so the harder it is to couple in energy to smaller and smaller things. Let me put it a different way. The easier way to explain it. When you make anything like an antenna or anything that couples to a, a wave, for it to be an efficient coupler, you have to be an appreciable fraction of the wavelength. So if something has a wavelength of a meter. Whatever is going to couple nicely to that is probably a half a meter or a quarter of a meter or an eighth of a meter, and as you go down, it gets worse. You all intuitively know this, right? Piano strings and violin strings, those things are all that size because that's the, the wavelength that you get out of sound and air. Same thing with light, which is, of course, what electromagnetic signals uh, are made of. It's so fast that things super small are just not going to be good resonators. They're too small. That's why your phone antennas are a certain size, why your cars always have that annoying nub coming out of the back of it. No matter what you do, physics makes that nut have to be a certain size. That's electromagnetic. Okay, so even if you go to ridiculous, you know, 50 gigahertz, you know, fun sounding, super high frequency stuff, it, it just doesn't couple anymore. That's the first one. It's very hard to couple in electromagnetic energy to tiny, tiny, tiny things. Sub millimeter. The next one is that your brain loves to take electromagnetic energy and suck it up and turn it into heat. It's related to the why you shouldn't have your cell phone next to your head all the time question. Um, and it's a, a, an annoying number. You really can't, you know, t 10 milliwatts per square centimeter of incident electromagnetic energy is usually enough to raise your brain to about, in that area, about, about to the degree. So you need to stay well above it. So these two things, you know, this says how high I can slam energy. Because you can say, well, it's not a good a, a resonator, but just turn up, you know, turn up the speaker, right? Just go going higher. Turn up to 11, right? Uh, it doesn't work because, you know, 11 is a really low number, and so you just, you just don't get enough energy. And so here's a plot. As a function of size of the thing that would be listening, here's a millimeter, here's a tenth of a millimeter, you can see that the efficiency of getting a, any transmission goes And I'll point out to you that the y-axis is at a log scale, so that's jumps of 10, it's impossible. Very, very difficult to couple anything in. Uh, I'll skip this experiment, you know, you can show this experimentally, it's absolutely true, we just can't do it. Okay, so now, because I'm running out of time, the, the, the five minutes left that you got to the punchline, what does work? And what does work is ultrasound because ultrasound has, beats both of those problems. The first issue is ultrasound is sound, and so the speed is very much slower. So it turns out that a 50 micron or 100 micron thing, actually, if done right in the right materials, I'll explain that, actually can wiggle to the tune of an ultrasonic signal rather nicely. Okay? The second one is that ultrasound, for reasons you all also intuitively know, because we use it for medical imaging, uh, Kind of goes through the body pretty well. You don't, you don't, every time you know you're imaging, you don't like superheat your body. It, the absorption of for ultrasound in, in tissue that the frequency you're talking about is very, very low. It's great. In other words, a, a wave will go through your body without dumping a lot of its energy as heat because of the way the molecules wiggle. Okay. And if you want to read about it more, we can talk about it. But I can show you the papers. But what's the what's the thing we're building now? Okay. What we're building is this is the idea. You have within the skull, but not puncturing the cortical tissue you have something that can generate little beats of ultrasound. Okay, very high frequency ultrasound, by the way, so 10 megahertz type ultrasound. I'll talk about what that is in a minute. That ultrasound propagates into the cortical tissue, but in the tissue, you've implanted it and closed everything up, little tiny crystals, very similar to the crystals that are used for timing references uh, in electronics. And the, the trick is, you make that crystal half of the wavelength of the ultrasound you're sending in, 
and you put two metal electrodes, you coat that crystal with two metal electrodes, and a funny thing happens. If you have a certain type of crystal called a piezo crystal, which we've been known for 100 years and did a lot of stuff for us in electronics, if you send in an ultrasonic signal, that thing begins to wiggle. As it mechanically wiggles, like a tuning fork, because that's the frequency you're sending in that it likes to wiggle at, as it wiggles, it'll produce a voltage across the plates. And as that voltage is produced, it's a sinusoidal voltage, I can use that voltage for two way, in two ways, which I hope you'll find amusing. You can first use that voltage to power whatever is connected on that crystal, so I can use it as a power supply. But more amusingly, I can, in a way I'll show you in a minute, by changing something electrical as a result of the neuron firing, I can mess with the incoming wiggle such that the thing that was sending the wiggle tells I was messing with it. So here's the way to, to do it. Imagine uh, you know, one of you has a tuning fork, and, and magically, because I'm such an amazing operatic signal, s singer, and that tuning fork is so perfect, I start going, oh, and that tuning fork, you, you start to do something, it starts to resonate. And you sit there with your finger, and you just touch it lightly. I'll be, somebody else in the audience, or I, will, should be able to hear the fact that you're doing that, right? Because it, the, the mere disturbance changes the reflected signal. And that's the key to this. It's called backscatter. You send in a carrier wave, it brings this thing up like a little tuning fork, but if something messes with that, which I'll show you in a minute, if something messes with that, the carrier wave itself is disturbed and can be detected by the thing that was emitting the signal. And so here's the trick. The trick is you put this in, and as neurons fire, you're sending this, this ultrasound through, through the cortex, and you're looking for where uh, it's been messed with and how, and I reconstruct the spike from this. Okay? That's neural dust. That's the idea behind neural dust. And, it, and it, uh, remarkably, a lot of the predictions we made in the have turned out to be true. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through, for, for maybe another minute or two, I don't want to be tedious, but I want to show you some fun facts. First of all, at the simplest level, the amount of power you can couple into one of these things, that's the blue curve, is way above what you could do with the electromagnetic. The red curve is the one I showed you, how everything just doesn't work with electromagnetics. The blue curve shows you how better it can go, even down to very small sizes, I can couple quite a bit of power. It's actually about 10 million times more power. It's amazing, just because that's a lot of scale. And so, uh, really, really, really uh, neat amounts of power that can get in, more than enough to drive circuits that might do something uh, interesting. Okay, I'm going to skip this. So, if you want specific numbers of power, you get 500, half a milliwatt can be delivered to that versus, say, picowatts with the other example. Now, bear with me for one amusing fun fact, and then we'll be done, I promise. There is one annoying thing that physics, again, intervenes and makes our life difficult. And this was the, the sort of tricky part of, of making this work. I have to have both of my recording sites on this little piece of junk, this little dust mode. I can't have one wire near the neuron and one wire really far away. Right? For obvious reasons, because everything has to be on that dust. As I make the dust smaller, the spacing between those two little electrodes gets closer and closer. Which means that the difference in potential between them is also going to get lower and lower, right? They're so close at some point that any neuron spike nearby really produces a tiny little signal, super tiny. So as I make this smaller, I run into a barrier, which is that I can't hear that little difference caused by the neuron over the background thermal noise that physics imposes on me. And one of the surprising and beautiful results of the work, I think, is that in fact, right around 50 microns, this breaks, and you can't hear the neurons firing above the noise, the thermal noise of the suit. You can't hear it above the wiggles of the, of the ions. But 50 microns is an amazing, amazing uh, size. I mean, it's really tiny. And we can cheat. I'll show you in a minute. So I'm doing a typical academic thing of showing you an impossible problem. And then going, what did I solve? <laughs> so the, the things look like this in our test bed. You know, these are, these are these little crystals. We've gotten down to 100 microns. We have a tank. All of you send me an email. You're welcome to come see us doing this. The tanks look like this. These are all our test sites. You know, we have these little dusts and water tanks that simulate a, a, the lost properties of the brain. We have all these methods for communicating with them. Um, and our data coming out is rather remarkable. The blue curve is the, that predicted by theory. This is plotting how small I make the dust mode. We build them at all the sizes that a red dot shows. And how much efficiency I get in transferring power. And what's really, honestly, as an engineer, practicing engineer now, it's remarkable that it's that good. I mean, nothing ever looks quite that nice, and it's looking pretty good. Um, even more interesting is that the backscatter we can hear off of these things is totally, uh, total, totally listenable. It's totally above the noise. We can 
Now to 120 microns, we've built them so far, and we can absolutely hear them. We can hear that little change uh, that a firing uh, neuron would produce. And so, armed with this, uh, and this is the conclusion of the talk really, and again, I skipped a lot of technical, I have 40 slides on math if you guys want to see it, but the, 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 the key is, what are we doing now? The next thing we're doing is we're putting these in peripheral nerves of the rat, because that's the most accessible thing before we go into brains. We don't want to get uh, rat brains yet. And the goal in the next semester, semester and a half, is really aggressively uh, showing that with this system, I can put this into a nerve, close up the whole nerve, and I can hear it fire. So that's of interest because this sort of peripheral data collection is, is also just almost as important as essential. And then as that starts to work, we, we on the order of probably December, January, we're looking at um, putting this into rat cortex and seeing hearing the first signals uh, coming out of an animal. Um, one other tissue, this is sort of the last slide for fun, it begs the question how you would hear and talk to many of them. And uh, it's a, we use a trick called beamforming, which is a similar to the way radars work. They, they have many elements and they can kind of pick where they're focusing their energy. And so we scan, you can scan the cortex and light up each of these in turn and get the signal back. So that, that allows you to scan many of them instead of just one. And so, with apologies at the end, it was a bit rushed and, and I kind of skipped over a lot of technical detail. It's really fun times. We're really happy that the first data came out in NeuroDust was so successful. Uh, that's published in Journal of Neuroscience Methods. And now we're really pushing you know, the next year to show that this would work in animals. And I should say, NeuroDust is a little part of the story. There's a huge effort um, at Cal. We're involved in you know, another six of these types of efforts, you know, electroprotocography for patients. I mean, I, I can, I'd love to stay and chat afterward if you're interested. There's just a lot of work going on, and we're lucky that we're kind of, we have the confluence of, of great people, because this, just NeuroDust, is the work of many, many people, and certainly the other projects are the work of even more people. It's a very difficult thing, but it's a great time to be doing it, building technology for the brain. So, thank you, apologies for going fast, and I will take any questions. Yeah, okay, so that's fun. So the, the simplest answer is at the tips of the, uh, the bed of needle arrays. And so we would put, bring them in, and we've experimented with these things that looks like the woodwork, contrary to my service. You push them in, and then you just either wait for something to resorb on a number, like sort of a little gel that's holding them for a minute or two. Or in some cases, surface tension does the trick if you pattern the tips right. You just push them in and push them out, and you let go. And, and you know, the, the brain, with the exception of puncturing vasculature, which is an issue because you can cause little blood clots, I mean, that happens when they do all this. The brain is remarkably resistant to this kind of acute, very careful abuse. It's not, you know, over months and years these things fall apart, but pushing it in and pushing it out, it's almost like you just push away the gel and the gel comes back. Um, and the, these, these processes are pretty resilient to that. It does cause damage, uh, but the, the key is that we don't leave anything in there causing that shaft of damage. Well, early on, thanks for amazing technology. Early on, you mentioned the uh, spontaneous uh, rewiring. Sort of yeah, oh. Well, functionally, what do you think is why is the brain is a far body reaction? What do you think is going on? Oh yeah, yeah. So this is this is uh, stuff I will be sort of parroting uh, Jose's research here, but I talked to him about that. So look, what's going on when you do this is you're recording. That recording goes to amplifiers, of course. Signal process. You run through some algorithm, and then that thing tries to run your arm. And then you're getting, at the very least, you're getting your eyeballs telling you what's going on. And you can see, for example, if you look online, there's a in non-human primates, the simple test that's done which is they're first taught to do a reach task, like hit that target, and of course a monkey can do it, that's not a monkey, not human. an HP can do it without a problem. And then without letting their arms move, you have the robot arm that's recording from electrodes, and they you know, go do reach, and uh, uh, you know, in, on order of days to weeks, they can learn this. What's happening is, it seems to be exactly what happens when you're learning to play tennis. So the neurons, so your, your computer is, is, of course, people that work for a long time, or not, well, not has been on for a long time, let's say five, 10 years, worked on getting those algorithms working just right, right? But what's the right algorithm? What do I have to do to have the computer do with these nine channels to run that arm so the monkey and so on? But what's even more remarkable is, it turns out that as long as the, uh, the subject, call it the, the NHP, can comprehend that what, whatever spike is going on is resulting in, volitionally in some action, in other words, it's a feedback loop, you can tell that something it's doing is resulting, however bad it may be, the neurons begin to rewire themselves towards fulfilling that target better and better. And so what's amazing, this is, this is a, you know, a few years ago, it came out, very well documented, it's been re reproduced, a beautiful result. You can load in all sorts of almost crazy algorithms, or make the algorithm get worse over time, or change it, and the neurons will compensate, they'll rewire themselves to run the machine. 
In fact, you can do an even cooler thing, which is you can teach it to use one decoding algorithm. So you load in some decoding algorithm that takes nine channels and figures out how to drive an arm. You train it to do that very well, and you come back 10 days later and you put in another one. And train it to do that one. And then when you switch back, it remembers the first one. So the neurons encode all this stuff. They, it's, it's just it's, it's what happens when you learn how to play tennis. Right? The first time, right? And then over time, you magically wake up and you're like, why did that happen? How come I have a backhand now? Right? So that, that's effectively what's going on. It's, just, it's amazing to see it happen at the junction of technology and the organic stuff. I was having trouble with the term dust. For one, it made it sound like extremely small, and two, many of them. Yeah. So, so but these are the devices that are outside the, 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 the uh, protective layers, and, and it's a power source and a... No, the dust is not. The dust is the stuff in the cortex, in the protective oh. We put in these little resonators into the cortex, close it up, and then just ping them and listen to them. That's why we call it dust. It's a little fancy. So the thing I was describing, this little quartz crystal mumbo jumbo, that's in here. It's super tiny. Oh, I was busy writing something. Yeah, this thing is also, by the way, a quartz crystal, just a really big one, so that it can send signals to all of these. And the part that I skipped, which is also interesting, is that this is big enough now, because this is centimeters and centimeters, to talk to the one outside your skull with using an old radio. It's a very conventional thing. So right now, what we're focusing on is proving this, and then we'll work our way backwards and start building whole systems. Yeah, I, I hope I didn't skip anybody, but I'll come back to it. But is this a one way thing? Are you just reading out for oh. a chance of actually? Uh, it's one way right now, but uh, there's another amusing fun fact, which is that uh, uh, Tyler, this guy, Professor Tyler, showed a few years ago that focused ultrasound can fire neurons. And so this is another thing to keep track of if you like keeping track of this stuff. There's this body of literature growing. This is sound work. It's not crazy, you know, like if I heat a neuron, it fires before it does. This is actually like, you know, it's real stuff. If you focus ultrasound, uh, within a certain range and a certain frequency, you can in fact cause enough of a disturbance to the membrane. It's not quite sure, people don't know why yet, but there's some theories. You cause enough of a disturbance that you almost force it to fire. And in some cases, and in some preparations, it appears to not be disruptive. Uh, in one that amuses me the most, and I think is very, very interesting, but I, I don't want to oversell it, so please be careful, is that there seems to be work out of Stanford that you can actually uh, raster this across and fire retinal cells this way, which you can imagine immediately. Uh, so, so there's lots of people are trying to sort of focus ultrasound to fire. We're not really, I don't think this platform produces, you know, provides any more. With the caveat that if you get enough power to this, this thing itself might be able to locally stimulate something in a controlled way, we're just not looking at that yet. It might be, but I don't, you know, I want to be careful there because that's not why we decided to do it. Yes? Um, a little bit blow my mind with this thought. <laughs> it's fascinating. Yeah. But, but, um, the, the rewiring that takes place of the neurons in that thing is a potential downside. Oh, well, like what? Well, I can think of some, but I, I don't want to. Well, I, I'm just thinking are there the, the unintended consequences that happen when you, when you do things. When you mess with that, yeah. Yes. I, I, you know, I want to first let me give you a comment. I don't, I don't, um, I personally don't do a lot of the DMI stuff, Jose does, and other people here do it, and so I, I don't want, I want to be careful and not inject you know, trouble for them, which isn't, you know, true. I think that, um, I don't, I don't see, you know, on the first pass I don't see any huge problem. And the issue is that what you're doing here is, is, you know, volitional, right? You can't, none of this happens if you're like lying there, you're volitionally trying, you must have a volition, you must have a, an intent to, to do this feedback. It's like playing tennis, right? You don't want to learn it, you don't want to sit there and learn. So this is not any kind of magical, like, I'm downloading, motor memory into you or anything like that. Having said that, people are working on that issue, but that's a different conversation. That's a different, you know, it's an interesting area of speculative work at the edge of this, which is to what extent can you can you really do this, right? Can you teach something that you picked up from this other person here and kind of rewire the neurons? But that's very, very speculative. Okay? It's almost irresponsible to it's very speculative. This type of motor memory is volitional, and so to the extent that you might cause something uh, weird I, I don't know. You have to you get into the nitty gritty of you know that somebody that deals with the cortex in a much more refined manner might tell you, you know, perhaps I'll give you an example, you know, it is true for example that if you play when when, when mice are very young, when, when they're learning things, if you expose them to certain auditory environments that are more narrow or are not the normal ones, like there's more of a particular frequency than there would be in the world normally, their auditory cortex compensates and more of the auditory cortex is now devoted to whatever it is that you've artificially created for it that it listens to 24-7, right? So it is true that the cortex expands in sort of what it's doing and changes what it's doing depending on what it's being asked to do. 
It's related to why if you, know, you lose your sight or you lose your hearing, the other senses suddenly seem like they're being retasked. They are. The cortex is saying, well, I don't use the cortex that anymore because my eyes don't work. And then the auditory part of it then takes up more of a cortical function. Uh, so perhaps you could envision, envision that something like this would happen, but it's, that's very, you know, there's no real really good way to answer it. On another topic, which you didn't ask, but I figure I'd volunteer, is that you know, certainly there are security issues that people have already brought up. This is a well-known issue. A lot of hype of this is made in the media, but I think it's responsible because you know, it's presented as though researchers and companies have not thought of what would happen if someone hacks these wireless things. That's total bullshit. I mean, the companies are well aware of this. It's a horrible liability. Can you imagine one of these people, you know, you start to deploy this, and it turns out that when you walk by with your Bluetooth phone or some imbecile trying to do something, something more, I mean, they know this is a liability issue. Even if it, obviously they're good people, but even if that they weren't, it's a liability issue. So, so, but that issue is front and center. People are very worried about the, the increased number of wireless, tetherless connections in, in hospitals in general and what people are doing. That's, it, that's being addressed. Yeah. How many particles are you able to sample from, and at uh, what rate are you able to sample from? Yeah, okay, great question. So, uh, we don't know. Uh, so, I'll give you the limits that are both by physics, and then we haven't gotten far enough to test. So, uh, first of all, you're not going to put them any closer than probably uh, a, a half to a single wavelength. So, you can't crowd them when they're all you know, more than a couple hundred microns from each other. Uh, the spot sizes that you can reliably get with a reasonable interrogator are probably a little worse than that. So, let's say two lambdas, so two wavelengths apart, is probably where I can illuminate spots that don't blur into each other. Then the issue is how fast can I do it? So the raster speed is not really that big a deal because it's all electronic, no mechanical kind of parts, you, you know, do this very fast. The question is, if you're sending out at 10 megahertz, you know, how much bandwidth does 10 megahertz have? Well, divide 10 megahertz by, say, 1 kilohertz, right? And you've got yourself about 1,000 times the bandwidth that you need to transmit. And so, you know, you could argue that if you can raster at 10 megahertz, like something about the jumping speed and there's low latency, you could probably do hundreds. Um, that's what we're going for anyway. So right now, that was a good point I should have mentioned. My dream is if I can get a dozen of these to work, you know, it'll probably take me the better part of a decade to get a dozen of them working, uh, I'll be super happy because a dozen is a dozen stable sites is amazing, right, for running a prosthetic. Uh, if we can in some future imagine a hundred, if physics allows it and people develop for it, then oh my god, right? I don't even know what to think about that. It will never, it, this is a, it has nothing to do with media coverage of this that suggested that we would sprinkle millions of fairy dusts every, you know, that's nothing to do with anything. It's just I hope that is. So at present, uh, this is uh, obviously a very uh, new research that uh, you haven't uh, been able to, to uh, couple the newer dust system with any prosthesis. You're, you're only sampling the, uh, the, 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 the spikes. In the yeah. yeah. The moment that we get spikes out, though, the coupling is, you know, that, that part is blowing in the kidney. So, so the, the difficult part will be to look at the the difficult part of what comes now is looking at um, motion artifact and all these sort of things that happen in real life, right, in the, in the lab that, that don't quite match the cartoon. And so, but, but the early data looks pretty good. So we'll hopefully have somebody to report on order of a semester. Right. I'll tell you what, how close that is. Who makes the your stuff? I do. No, no, we have a we have a bazillion dollar nanofabrication facility here. This is all done with semiconductor, you know, lithography and shape. Similar to the computer chip. Absolutely. Now the, the that's a little bit disingenuous because it turns out that you can buy uh, pre-cut quartz at these scales actually, just at the edge of what can be done. And so the processing that we then have to do to at least validate it is actually very straightforward. Um, my bread and butter is microfabrication nanofabrication. So uh, it, was a, it was much better than if I had to sort of grow piezo from scratch and just all sorts of horrible things. But um, the next part of the, we're hoping to be part of a funded effort soon on this, and that next part will be building up a, an aggressive fabrication process for this. But it's all, it'll all be done here. If you dream ahead, besides controlling prosthesis, what other kinds of applications? Oh, that's dangerous. I'll give you. I'll give you two that are public, so I don't. I, I don't get in trouble by spinning. And the problem with all this is that you quickly spin into people's dreams that are kind of irresponsible. Right? It's like my pet peeve with CNN every three days telling you cancer is going to be cured after a while. You're like, okay, well, I've heard this a few times. So uh, there's a couple of things that were done that were remarkable. So Miguel Nicolelis, okay, N I C O L Nicolelis from Duke, is one of the people to, to follow, which has credentials in this and has been a responsibly speculative. And his lab has come up with some really neat stuff. Jose, by the way, is his cousin. 
So one of them is they put in a, an infrared detector on the head of a rat or a mouse. Or and what they did was they crisscrossed the rat's environment with invisible infrared beams, right? Just with little little emitters. And then what they did is they coupled the detector to, to the cortex in this in a similar in this way, basically. And what the rat was able to do was it would tell when the detector was running into infrared lights. And so it trained itself to see infrared. Wow. So now you have a rat that effectively does whisker avoidance, except instead of the whiskers touching the, it, was, it knew they were infrared beings, and so the rat effectively was detecting infrared, which is nuts if you think about it, right? So that, I think you can remember that for a while, and you can speculate yourself anyway. Another one was, there was a recent result where they had one rat recording from one rat and stimulating the other. And so there were two rats working in tandem, basically, where one rat's, the stuff one rat was doing is basically causing signals to be put in that vortex on the other one. And the, the other rat quickly real, you know, learned a bunch of stuff that it couldn't have learned on its own because the other rat was learning. It was really creepy. That was another interesting game. Like, yeah, very recent. They matched it up. Yeah, very primitive. You have to, you know, you know, it's not like, there's nowhere near things like, let's not get carried away from memory. This is very early stage. But at a motor, on a motor level, it's pretty amazing the kind of stuff that's done. They have uh, non-human primates in virtual reality environments now, so all the stuff is done where the, the, the animal really is in a different, completely different immersive environment where you're teaching a task that only exists, you know, in an immersive environment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a lot of this stuff going on. Uh, I'm trying to point you to, so Nicolelis and, and, and Duke, uh, there's one other, I just, it just fled my mind, I'm having one There's another good one on order of this stuff, but I'll, I'll remember in a minute. But there's a lot of this um, growing, you know, sort of what can you do with BMI? Question. I'm guessing that the, the order of size of your neural dust master sites are going to clear them. Yeah, well, interesting enough. So, another good question. Um, we don't think that the astrocytes are capable of clearing them uh, entirely, or, or you know, we, don't, we don't really have a good sense of how they might be disturbed, you know, sort of in terms of being moved. Uh, so, that's data that has yet to be taken. But what's interesting is here's another speculative one. We're part of a, because we did this, we're part of a study now in Nebraska to see if macrophages, which I know, you know, we're completely different, but macrophages can engulf these things and move them. And the reason is the NIH is interested in whether you could do blood barrier penetration by having a macrophage carry these things from your vessels up into your brain. I think that's highly unlikely, as like, awesome as it sounds, because a macrophage might well be able to engulf something large, I don't know how large, but you know, let's say it's capable of engulfing this giant, you know, building. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't mean that blood brain barrier is going to let it through, right? It's going to be like, it's me, let me through. And he's like, yeah, you normally fit through a 100 nanometer hole. What are you going to do now? Like, ah. <laughs> the physics is still there, right? The neural dust is not made out of taffy. So, <laughs> you know, but what we're doing the study, I don't think, I don't think astrocytes are going to, are going to do a lot of, uh, they may very well, glial may very well encapsulate them, which is absolutely documented. Glial encapsulation is a well-known fact in these. Uh, but what is interesting is that all the data that exists for shanks, for, you know, long needles, is that as you more or less hit about a, a cell diameter, glial encapsulation starts to drop off precipitously. So uh, Kipke, um, uh, who's founded uh, uh, a NeuroNexus uh, and used to be at Michigan, has a, has a result with sort of sub six micron carbon fiber where there's very little glial encapsulation. Whether you believe that, you know, that you can get into very technical details of how we think about it, but we certainly believe that the glial encapsulation will be very, very low. We'll see. And that would uh, create uh, a barrier to the, the signal that was being sent possibly? It, yes and no. So glial encapsulation, when it gets, you know, as glial encapsulation grows, what happens is it's, it's harder and harder. The signal decreases. It's there, but it drops because the glial are in the way. It's sort of blocked your resistant path. Uh, but, but people certainly record through glial encapsulation. And, and so we feel that given the data that exists in the field, we shouldn't be, you know, it'll make it worse, but hopefully manage it. It's, it's also a big issue with stimulating, because the glia get in the way and it's sort of fry the glia and you're kind of stimulating for one of these. Thank you. This morning, if not uh, literally, then metaphorically, we've had our brains expanded. <laughs> <laughs>